I'm Kath Nolan. Um, I will be your... Oh, God, this is in the worst place to stand. I've got to work out where I'm going to stand. It's going to take me a while. Um, I will be your guide to the fundamentals of contract law. Um, gee, there's a lot of you. Um, and this is... A, well, this is going to be a better room than having a lecture theatre because you do need to talk to each other. Um, although those computer screens on the table are going to take up a bit of space. Um, for those of you at home, I don't know, maybe I'll take a picture so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, there's some chairs over here, um, but yeah, you'll get yourself sorted. Uh, the reality is, I know all of you are saying it won't be me, but um, lots of you are not going to come. Oh, we won't see you again until the last class. Uh, that's pretty much how it goes every time because I make truly excellent recordings. Um, I don't know, I clearly it's part of my procrastination. Uh, I have procrastinated the art of getting recordings happening. So basically I will upload sometime in the next 48 hours, uh, usually quicker than that because I do like to go for a run with some girlfriends on a Tuesday morning and I won't let myself do it unless I get the recordings up. So if the weather's terrible sometimes it takes a bit longer but um, basically there will be a YouTube recording where you hear my dulcet tones. Yeah, I know, for those of you who come from other places especially, I have a terrible flat Australian accent. I need to go and do some diction at some stage. Uh, and so you'll hear my terrible drainy voice and you will see the slides. Um, and hopefully what will actually happen is that you will be, the people in the room will be super well prepared. There are lots of desk lectures, so the actual talking head stuff you've already got available to you. I'll explain what I mean by that shortly and we will spend a lot of the time in the seminars actually talking, solving problems, doing some activities, things like that. So, um, okay, I don't know how many fans of How I Met Your Mother there are, but this is contract law. Um, uh, yeah, so somebody knows the excellent scene where, yeah, he almost met his true love. Um, so, yeah, if you're in the wrong place, or you're listening to the wrong recording, now is the time to leave. Um, or if you, this is also a good time to get away if you just think you're going to hate it. Um, before we commence, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we will study, we will learn and we will turn into lawyers over time. I would like, uh, at, at RMIT, that is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. There are two language groups that uh, are the unceded owners of the land on which we stand and we study. Uh, and I would like to acknowledge their elders past and present and emerging, and in particular, any Aboriginal people who are in this room today. Um, and I really like starting my class with that. I like being able to start on the basis that we're starting this adventure together. 13 weeks time, it'll be our last class for a little while and you guys will think about the world in a slightly different way. In fact, I, I like to come and meet you early because I really like to meet people before they start thinking like lawyers. And the reality is, in 13 weeks' time, there are a whole lot of little things you will have even stopped noticing by then that you approach the world in a different way. And so I think it's a serious thing that we're embarking on and it should be noted in a serious way. So just take a little moment to look around and see the people that you're embarking on this journey with. Most of you don't know each other very well yet. Some of you spent a very intensive weekend together. Uh, chances are you sat next to somebody who looked a bit like you or seemed to have something in common with you. I would really encourage you to try and mix it up a little bit over this time. Uh, there's a lot of research that shows the best indicator of whether you get good marks or not is whether your friends get good marks or not. Um, most people who do a university degree will say at the end of their university degree, I had three or four good friends. Most people meet their three or four good friends in the first couple of weeks. Uh, so if this is your first couple of weeks, I would suggest keep trying. You might have struck gold right at the very beginning, but I would suggest keep trying because the other indicator of just general awesomeness in my view, but also good marks, 
is the groups that overall get the best marks are groups that are diverse. Diverse in the ways that they think, diverse in the places that they come from, diverse actually in the programs that they do. And these days, you know, you, most of you will be working full time, most of you will be doing all sorts of other things. You don't actually have a lot of opportunity to meet people who at university who aren't doing JDs. Um, but I would suggest you try and do that when you can. Um, You'll find I do this a lot. I just sermonise. I don't know why. I think it's just because my children don't listen to me and I feel the need to get out and, you know, just be everybody's mother. So, first things first. For those of you at home, that is what I look like. It's not really. It's about 10 years old, that photo, but I don't look terribly different. Uh, and, um, you know, I'd like to say I'm a bit taller, but other than that, nothing's pretty much verifiable. Uh, Details for where you can contact me are on that slide. You will have the slides. They are on Canvas. I just updated them today. I do that. It's really annoying. In fact, if I had my way, I wouldn't give you the slides at all. The slides are for me, so they roughly keep me on track and remind me to cover all of the material. And if you didn't have them, I could do them in whatever order was logical in the moment. But as it turns out, yeah, everybody complains when I do that. So the slides are up there. but as is my way when I'm doing the prep, which is quite often on the day that I present to you, I will go through everything again and I will think, hmm, no, today I would like to do this slightly differently. Or there's a new case or there is something that came out of the way we did it last semester that's made me think I might be able to explain that in a better way. So there were a couple of those things that came up, in fact, today. So for those of you who... I really hope they're very small numbers of you who actually went through that terrible exercise of printing out the slides because really you don't like trees. But anyway, those of you who did that, the slides might be slightly different. And in fact, that might happen a lot. But the content will basically be the same. You'll be able to work it out. Um, so who am I? I am not really an academic. I think we should get that out at the very beginning, just in case you want to complain. There'll be lots of things to complain about, so you can just add this to your list. Um, I am, I like to call myself a pracademic. Uh, I am a lawyer, which is probably a good start. That's a good start, but I do not have a PhD. Uh, I am not a doctor. I am a commercial lawyer. I have had, well, I was admitted 30 years ago this December. Uh, I worked for five years as a paralegal in a large law firm before that. So I think it's appropriate to say I had more than 30 years experience as a commercial lawyer. I started out in the big firms. I actually started out as a natural resources lawyer, which is kind of weird. So I did electricity power station privatisations early in my career. Uh, I also did a reasonable amount of mining and exploration work. You, don't you love it the way lawyers, we say we made the work, we did the deal, we didn't at all, we just shuffled the papers to make the actual people who did the work do the work. But anyway, I did that kind of stuff in big firms. I was never particularly comfortable in uh, the natural resources space, although I have to say, it was less abhorrent than I expected it to be. Most of the clients I had uh, were actually kind of fairly decent at what they did, which I didn't expect having spent a bit of time tied to a tree at the Franklin. That does date me, doesn't it? Uh, so, and I'm, you've probably worked this out already. I am a geek. I actually identify as a 12 year old boy. Uh, I spend a lot of time in front of computers and I have always been fascinated about how technology can change our lives. And I sort of used my infrastructure experience and really buying and selling mines and power stations and took that into the technology space, initially in, um, in China, uh, but ultimately I've done things all over the world now. So I, um, I basically went from big firms, I then spent some time in an investment bank, I then was in a very small firm, uh, sort of a spin out from the investment bank with only three partners. Uh, I then was a sole practitioner for a little while um, and I have also been both an actual and a virtual in-house counsel with a number of startups. I've taken two technology, fintech technology companies to listing, uh, which should mean that I am rich beyond my wildest dreams. Turns out my dreams were not very wild. So uh, at one stage when I was doing one of the startups, 
somebody said to me, you know, why don't you teach acquisitions, takeovers and mergers for us over summer? And I thought, why not? And the rest, as they say in the classics, is history. I have been teaching here since 2012, um, basically commercial law type subjects. Unlike most of my beautiful colleagues, particularly those who work here full time, I'm not a public lawyer. I am, I do it for the money. I do transactions that involve money and I move money from one place to another place and hopefully make more money for lots of people, particularly me. Um, but uh, I have been described as the last of the great bleeding heart corporate lawyers. But at the end of the day, I'm a transactional commercial lawyer. And many of you and the program here is very much a public law focus. Though clearly, everybody who goes through the program gets qualified to do everything. Um, and then you start and actually do it in practice. Uh, but I guess that is one of the things that I will bring is that I bring a particularly commercial focus to the way that we do things. Um, so that's me. I've been involved in writing contracts for a very long time. Notice I say writing contracts. This subject I think has the wrong name. We call it fundamentals of contract law and then you go on to do advanced contract law. Like that other subject is like this only harder. Um, you know like I started learning to swing dance recently and um, apparently you go through all these different you know so level one, level two, it sort of sounds like level two so the, mus the steps will be just faster. In fact, it's not like that at all. This is about making contracts. The next subject is about breaking and ending contracts. There's, this is the beginning, the other one is the end. Uh, so I come to this as a transactional lawyer. I write contracts. I actually don't want my contracts to be looked at by a judge ever. Uh, so that's what we're doing in this class, is we're looking at how contracts are made so that we can be writers of contracts or for those of you who are not the lovers in the room, for those of you who are the fighters so that you can understand where the flaws might be so you can pull them apart. As I mentioned, I am a casual lecturer. Um, so as a consequence, I actually don't have an office on campus. I sometimes come to campus because sometimes they have cool things going on here. Uh, but usually, if you want to consult with me, you will find that I don't have office hours. Um, and I work in my very nice study, which you've probably seen if you've seen the videos. Um, I've now recently got a fireplace. I'm turning into a hermit. I don't leave. But I have video conferencing. I have a telephone. I am pretty easy to contact. Um, if Particularly if your question is about content, if your question is about approaching the subject, uh, if it's stuff that I can help you as, as a teacher, please, you work out how urgent it is and use a methodology that makes sense. I will make sure I get back to you in 48 hours if you send me an email, often sooner. If you ring me, I will pick up the phone if I'm not doing anything else, but I will get to your message probably a little bit quicker. Um, if you ring me and you don't leave a message, I probably won't call you back. I did actually call somebody back today, but it was largely because I was frustrated that I couldn't find my phone on my desk. But I very, very rarely do that. Um, so you need to leave me a message. You need to tell me what your name is. And then if you ring me and I put your name in my phone and I know who you are, I will actually pick it up because, you know, just otherwise people are trying to sell me light globes and solar panels and it just gets boring. Um, Oh, well, I'll get to this. Um, yeah. I then got really bored with answering questions, so somebody rang me earlier about the room, which is fine because it's going to happen. But questions about rooms and uh, where you, you know, where, what the textbook is or what date and assignments do or what my policy is about word limits or what you need to do to get an extension or all that kind of admin -y stuff. I made a robot. And like, largely, I just probably want to show you that because I made a robot. Like, how, how many people do you know that can say, I made a robot? Like, 
I'm really, really pleased with my robot. Um, she's called the Cathbot and she loves answering questions about ad mini things. She probably sucks because, like I said, 54-year-old woman made a robot. Um, this is my first robot. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, you can be anonymous and I won't know which of you are bitching and moaning about it. Uh, but basically, there are links in Canvas to it. I also made that lovely scan thing so you can find it. And effectively, it works by you just clicking the little buttons. I wonder if I can do it. Oh, look, I can. Um, I can click the buttons here and it will ask you things like your name, which I can't do from here, um, and whether you're OUA or face-to-face, -face, because that's how the logic works. We're giving you, hopefully, the right answers. So feel free to give me that, give that a go. Tell me if it sucks. Tell me if you can't find a question that you want to ask on it, because that just amuses me and helps me build more robots. Um, anyway, enough. Sorry, I need to get down to here. Is that going to do that? Yes. All right, a little bit about me teaching. Um, you're mostly too young to remember the Dewey Decimal System. Um, but basically, Dewey, who created the Dewey Decimal System, which was those funny numbers for working out what library books are, uh, did a lot of research back in the 1930s about what it takes to learn. And what he effectively discovered is that the more actively engaged you are with what's going on around you, the more likely you are to retain and make sense of information. So I'm using retention here as a proxy for the idea of learning. So right now, you're going to take in about 5% of what I say because you are sitting passively and doing nothing. Um, and the reality is I'm probably going to remember about 90% of what I say because I'm the one who's actually doing something. So my philosophy of how we're going to work this class is I want you guys doing things as much as possible. So, um, Sarecha, is that right? Yep. <laughs> we met on the weekend and I don't know why it came up, but we were talking about what people complain about. One of the things that people will complain about this class is there is too much work to do. There are too many quizzes, there is too much reading, there is too many, too many videos, there are too many, too many, too many, and it's overwhelming. For some of you, I need to say, actually, you need to take a deep breath and if you are concerned that there are too many things, particularly when you notice that many of them seem to overlap and be quite similar, we need to think about remember this moment because what I'm trying to do is give you as many different ways as I can for you to learn something. Teaching and learning are different things. All I can do is facilitate, it's your job to do the learning. So the analogy I often use is this is like a high class gym. I am going to provide you with lots and lots of shiny exercise equipment big posters with all sorts of different exercises that you can do, but the reality is whether or not you get a six pack is entirely up to you. I can't do the exercising for you. So there will be different exercises that suit different people. Um, many of the weeks you will see that the lecture content I have created what I call desk lectures. So the stuff where I can be a talking head and just talk to you, I have actually already recorded that. Um, the great thing about contract law is it doesn't change very much. Um, I add little ones in when it does change. I've tried to keep them to less than 15 minutes each. I haven't always been successful in doing that. Um, but basically they're little chunks each week so you can watch the content in advance. There's tons of reading. The reality is if you don't like reading or writing, probably studying law might be something you might want to rethink because they are the tools of our trade. The words are the tools of the trade. So um, there will be a lot of reading. There will be these little lecture, desk lectures as I call them. There will be quizzes that I put together, some of which we'll do in class. They mirror the ones that are on the canvas anyway so you can check how well you've understood. There are problems that you can do. How much of that you do will depend on you. Often the quizzes are a really good way of working out how well you've understood the reading. Um, because if you get it all right, you know, you're probably golden, right? Um, if you're not getting them all right, then you probably can work from there where you need to concentrate some more efforts. So, I just thought I'd point out that I get to learn more than you because I get to do the moving around all the time. So, classroom expectations. 
I don't know. I think some people, other people are using my slides now, so <laughs> you might be seeing this over and over. But this is where I start. My plan is for us to start and to finish on time. Starting on time means finishing at about five, sorry, starting at about five minutes after our start time, so 6.35. That's, we started right on 6.30 today and that would actually be my preference. It just depends on whether I can get in the room or not because you might have noticed I need to set up my kit so that we can make this recording. Um, you guys should come. If you can come, you should come. If you think, oh no, she's going to start on time, she's going to start, she's not going to recap, don't not come. Um, just come in, be quiet, sit down, don't expect a recap, ask your mates during the break. Um, from next week when people come in, I will encourage people to sit on the other side of the room first, not the door side, so that those who do come in late, because you work, you've got to deal with traffic, it's cold. People have dogs and kids and mother-in-laws and all the things that keep us running late. So just don't let that stop you from coming. Um, but at the end of the day, we will start on time. Finishing on time, we, I know your timetable till 9.30, but we will, not, we will finish at 8.30. In fact, we'll finish probably 10 to 15 minutes before that to let people get home at a reasonable time. You have three hours of timetable class. It's timetabled that way for reasons that, well, a lot of the classes will be three hour seminars, but when the university moved them to 6.30, uh, we agreed as a law school that it just wasn't safe to have people going home at 9.30 at night. And I run an online shoot once a week anyway. So, I, well, either you drew the short, short straw or I drew the short straw, I'm not exactly sure. But we're redesigning this course in particular to be two hours of seminar time, one hour of online tute time, and that one hour includes um, that online, the OUA people are more and more uh, absolutely welcome to be there. Um, I know you're just all looking at me like stunned mullets at the moment, um, but you're going to talk to me and you don't need to put up your hand uh, unless you need to give some sort of indication if everybody's yelling, but like we need to have a conversation. When we're having conversations, I will probably come and stand somewhere near you so that we can get your voice on the recording. If for any reason you don't want your voice on the recording, <laughs> you need to let me know. We need to deal with that in some way, um, but it really can't affect the flow of the class. Uh, this is one class, whether you're online or face-to-face, -face, and as I mentioned, many of you will not, well, I won't see you again, uh, and you will appreciate the value of having nice, clear recordings. Um, I think we need everybody to participate, um, but don't judge what participation means. Um, People participate in different ways. Some people will participate a little bit too much. Uh, they will hear their voices a lot. Um, and I might be actually saying to the person, just hang on a minute, let's see if somebody else wants to have a go, and there'll be complete silence. Um, that will happen. Um, on the other hand, some people will just want to absorb it all before they make any comment. People participate differently. If you think the way that you're going to participate is sleeping, maybe you should rethink that. If you think the way you're going to participate is looking at something else on your computer, text messaging other people, again, I'd like you to rethink that because it is distracting to others. Uh, actually, that's pretty much what I just said. You need to bear with me, though, if I repeat. If I don't think you're loud enough to hit the recording, um, also, sometimes repeating questions just gives me an opportunity to think about the answer. Um, if you can, you're going to do the pre-reading. So we're Mondays, which makes it a little bit tricky. So I would, if I were you, think about your week from contract law as finishing on a Wednesday. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you're preparing for the next class. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday are uh, consolidating, doing the quizzes, making your notes, doing that kind of thing. That's how I would think about it. You are grown-ups, you know the best way for you to work. But even though we're going to talk about it in weeks, the reality is you need to be prepared for a Monday. 
Um, like I said, if you've got questions, I will try and get back to you within 48 hours. If you send me questions personally, look, the reality is you're smart people. The chances are, if you ask me a question, it's a good question. So it would be good to share it on the discussion boards. The problem with discussion boards is I often miss them. I don't know why, I just don't notice when people put questions on there. I think it's just a very noisy environment. So email me a question and know that I am likely to go and put it on the discussion board with my answer. Um, I will anonymise it um, unless you need to take credit for it, which you should if you are particularly amusing or you work out that I have made a mistake. <laughs> happens a lot. Uh, so, uh, yeah, if you can do that and then I can put it on both discussion boards and make sure that you're all in the same place. I, I'm, I'm pretty good at getting back to people. Um, 48 hours is kind of, you know, like the goal that I know I can meet. Um, the other thing that you should think about is how stressed you are. If you really need to know right away, then use a mechanism for contacting me that demonstrates to me that you are stressed and that you need to talk to me soon. Um, I turn my phone off in the evenings usually. I don't sit in email all day. I choose when I go and look at those things so you're not interrupting me. A ringing me will interrupt me, um, but I'm very good at not answering the phone when I am with somebody else. She just says, remembering that she hasn't turned it off, so if it rings during this class, um, you will see me ignore it. Um, phones, bring them to class, please. We will use them. Uh, for some things, but I would genuine, genu genuinely prefer that you use them for the things we're using them for and otherwise we don't see them, we don't deal with them. They're distracting enough for you, but they're really distracting for other people. Computers, particularly in this room, if you are buying and selling things on eBay, looking at porn, gambling, playing solitaire, looking at Facebook, doing any of those other things that the internet was designed for, uh, chances are you will be uh, distracting somebody else, particularly me. I, my ability to just stop dead and stare at somebody's screen when they're on Facebook, particularly if they've got little kids, is like, it's unbelievable. So remember, it's not just distracting you, it's distracting other people as well. If you really need to do those things, just could you go and sit with just a wall behind you. Um, and if that's where you need to stand because you have a bad back or anything, we will actually judge you and think you are probably watching porn. Um, you will get the slides in advance. I might change them. I probably will change them. I will rearrange them. Um, and everybody will be fine. <laughs> it, will, it will work out okay. Um, what else? putting you on the spot here. There are a lot of you here. You've presumably uh, been in many classes before. Is there anything in particular that you would like to add to this list? If you can think of anything, please let me know and I will put it to the group. Um, oh, yes. Social media, you can find me at Nolan Legal, and when I tweet on stuff that relates to contract law, um, which is not all that often, I must admit, but I do do it sometimes, RMITFCL is the hashtag I use for contract law things. Structure for our two hours will look something like this. And so for you at home in the world of OUA, you can expect two recordings of roughly somewhere between 40 and 55 minutes each week. Um, unless it's really easy for me to cut them up into smaller bunches. But we'll start about five minutes after the scheduled start to give everybody time to get in, settle in. And that's more with the class behind, behind us leaving, although they look pretty good today. They look like they might be out on time. Take a five minute break, roughly halfway, uh, and then we'll crack on with it and try and be out by seven, sorry, 8.25. Um, yeah, we're a bit of a hike to the station as well for those of you who are taking public transport. Um, yep, everything will be recorded. It should be up by Wednesday. Um, it's usually up before, but it sh it'll 
be there by Wednesday afternoon. And as a consequence, those of you in the world of OUA, not only do you get to go to class in your pyjamas if you want to, but all of your assessment dates are two days later because there is a risk that you are getting the materials two days later than everybody else. All right. Quite a lot of you have done that. This was as at yesterday, I think. Um, I need to schedule a drop-in tutorial. So I call it a drop-in tutorial uh, because basically you can do it anywhere that you have an internet connection and as a minimum a phone, but I would suggest an internet connection and a computer was the best way because I often share a screen. Um, it's kind of like a cosy fireside chat. Uh, and we will talk through problems. We'll talk usually because, depending on when they're held, but usually they've been held in the past on Sunday nights almost always, and that continues to be a relatively popular time by the looks of things. Uh, we're often talking about the week that's just gone and the preparation for the following week. Um, it's a place where you bring your questions. Uh, and we have a conversation. I usually have some exercises ready to go just in case nobody has questions. Um, it's pretty easy technology to join in with. Um, I just need to know when you want to do it. I've ranked these, there are like an equal first and as a consequence an equal third uh, options. Um, so clearly um, uh, we're looking at either 6.30 or 7.30 p.m. on a Sunday at the moment. Um, I'm relatively keen, I must say, to have it at uh, lunchtime on Thursdays uh, because that sort of breaks up my week and means that... Um, oh, well, actually, it probably means somebody else in my house cooks dinner. Maybe I should think this through. Um, but it probably means that I definitely won't have wine when I'm actually doing the tute, which... It's a little bit more dubious on other cases. No, it's not. That's not true. Uh, anyway, if you haven't done the survey yet, I am going to... Um, I think it's, I said it would be the 27th is when I'm going to make a call on what that time is. So please do that. Um, if you don't think you'll ever go to one, please indicate that as well and I will sort the data that way because if you're putting in preferences but you say, yeah, I probably won't go, uh, then I will give you a lower weighting in favour of those who are saying I will rearrange my whole world to be there even if it's an inconvenient time. The next piece of advice I am going to give you is that you need to plan your semester. Sorry, that's quite a um, messy little uh, or faint little um, gif there sort of showing what the inside of Canvas looks like. Oh, sorry, me drinking probably sounds terrible on the recording. Um, but I think it's really important that you spend a little bit of time working out not only when you have to be in classes, but what assignments you have and what preparation time that you have. So you block out that time before it gets taken over by other things. Um, one of the things that Canvas has that is really handy is this fabulous calendar tool. Um, and um, I think I think I can do it here. Yes, oh, big, um, yes. That little blue line down there, which I've tried to highlight, but I'm not holding on to very carefully, um, that's the little link to the calendar. So those of you who use Outlook or Google Calendar or any kind of electronic cal calendar, particularly at work, you can go and use that link to make sure that the things that are due in your assignments are in your calendar and you can work backwards from there to block out time to make sure that you get them done. Um, look, there are lots of smart people here, but you know, the people who do the best in a law degree are the people who are organised. Um, so spending the time to do a little bit of organising is well and truly worthwhile. I hate talking about assessment at all, but I know it's one of the things that you guys really want to get your heads around really early on. Um, if you want to know how to piss me off, um, start a question with, is it on the test? Do I need to know it for the exam? Will this be on the exam? Will this be covered by the assignment? Um, 
Because the reality of the world of you being a lawyer is there will never be a client who says, who came in and said, look, I know you weren't really paying attention in week three, so I've organised my whole uh, requirement for advice to exclude anything to do with consideration. Um, like, that's just not how it works. Um, when your clients come to see you, they won't even, you won't, <laughs> they won't even know whether they have a legal problem, much less whether the contract relates to contract, uh, uh, the problem relates to contract law. You, when I ask you a question, you already have a framework. OK, we're in contract, so chances are it's got something to do with contract law. We're in week one, so chances are it's got something to do with that tedious reading that I had to do before I came to class. Like, you can narrow it in, but in the real world, that it doesn't work like that. Um, but I do know that you being prepared gets you better results. And one of the ways that we get along is that you will uh, humour me and understand that the reason I tell you these long-winded stories that I will tell you is because I want you to be good lawyers. And then I will humour you by being as clear as I possibly can about what's required on the assessments. So basically, in week five, actually technically the beginning of week six for our online colleagues, you will be submitting a memorandum to your supervising partner. Uh, you will get that problem after I release the recording for week three. So you will only actually have two weeks to do this in. In week three, I will give you an overview about how to write a memorandum uh, and we will talk about problem solving. Uh, then, um, yeah, sorry, week three. Um, in week nine, technically week ten, so end of week nine, beginning of week ten for uh, the OUA guys, you will be required to submit a letter of advice to a client and a supporting memorandum. So it basically scaffolds. It builds off the first assignment. So you will get feedback on that first assignment and from that you will go to the next step. I will explain it as clearly as I am able. Um, the problem for that assignment will be released around the semester break, probably during the semester break. Um, I'm actually teaching a class in Vietnam during the semester break, so I am going to be going like the clappers to get the um, assignments marked before I head overseas so that you have feedback around the same time that you get the second task. So you can start planning for the second task. Why don't I give you the problems up front? Well, it could just be that I'm mean. There is that. Um, but mainly, it's because I hate that question, is it on the test? When we're doing the work in the classroom, I want you to be thinking about all of the issues, not just the ones you've identified that are in the problem. Uh, and so I will give you the problem after we've gone through the issues, or well, most of them anyway. With this second uh, piece of assessment, some of the uh, relevant pieces may actually require you to do research in topics we haven't yet covered. Then, um, if you are in the world of OUA, this can be relevant to you as well, but 5% of the online student marks comes from their participation in the discussion boards. Now, you might have noticed already as face-to-face -face students that there are 10 different discussion board tasks, one for every week starting next week, um, and there is a problem. Or oh, actually, I think eight of them are problems and two of them are a critical analysis. Basically, the kinds of problems that are in the discussion boards or well, particularly the second half of the semester, pretty similar to the kinds of problems that you might see on an exam. Can you see how I'm trying to help you get ready for this? So that, you know, because exams are not exactly authentic assessment. You don't actually have to go into a client and answer everything perfectly in two hours without access to the internet in real life. So basically what happens with these discussion board tasks is uh, you submit an answer. You can't see anybody else's answer until you submit your own. And you can only see other people's once you submit one yourself. And anybody who tries to do it differently by just submitting garbage so they can see what other people do will see the wrath of Kath. I might look little, but I'm pretty feisty. Um, basically, 
they are an opportunity to practice problem solving. Now, for the OUA guys, partly because they are a much smaller group, partly because they do not have the opportunity to talk to each other in class the way that those of you who are face to face do, I have separated out the first assignment so that it is worth 15% and they can get up to 5% of their marks for doing that. The reason I don't do that for you is basically because I am a tight ass. They effectively do not pay me to do it and it takes me about a day of my life to give you feedback. Now, I will happily give you feedback if you guys do it. I will give you the same feedback, including what your mark would have been. Because I like doing it for students who want to learn something. But if I have to do it because that's, you know, it's just not actually financially viable for me. So I'm, I'm out and proud I'm telling you what how it works. So I'm actually rethinking for OUA. Um, some OUA people think that it's unfair that they get more assessment tasks than the rest of you. I actually think I am giving them more love than I'm giving the rest of you because the science shows me that you are more likely to do it if you get a mark for it than not. Uh, and there is definitely definitely a correlation between people who do the problem tasks and who do well on the exam because you get feedback on how to write exam type answers. So it is completely up to you. Do not feel bad if you don't do them because I'm actually a really interesting person with lots of things to do with my time. I really don't mind not doing them, but I also really enjoy doing them for people who actually want to do the work. Similarly, for your people in OUA who are listening, um, if you don't do them, it's actually only 5%. It is not going to make a material difference to your marks. The way that that 5% is calculated is based on the best five submissions. So many people only do five. Some people will do three. Some people will do none. Some people will do all 10. It's completely up to you. It is really just a mechanism for giving you feedback. Then sometime around 14, 15 weeks from now, uh, there will be an exam. It will cover the whole of the course and it will be worth 50% of your mark. It will be an open book exam, but open book means paper in this environment. It doesn't mean anything electronic. Uh, so we will talk much more about what the exam looks like as we move through the semester. Um, with assessment tasks, one of the things that you really need to be mindful about is the assessment criteria. So this is just going to keep, this slide is just going to keep rolling through. It's actually pointing at the first of the discussion board problems. And if you go up to that little spot up the top and download it basically, oh, sorry. Uh, there's a little, uh, those little ellipses, it, you can pull down the rubric. And the rubric will, in each case, set out uh, what the criteria are, what percentage it is, and provide you with some guidance as to what it is that we are looking for. Sorry, hitting the wrong buttons left, right and centre. The other thing that is worth actually having a look at at some point is this is what each of the categories for marking look like in the JD. Now, I'm, I'm saying this because I'm in a room full of smart people. Many of you in the room will have always been one of the smartest person people in the class. Some of you in the room will be the smartest people in this class. Might not be me, uh, but some of you will be. But some of you will, for the first time in your lives, find that it is much more difficult than it has been before. One of the problems with being a smart person is often you don't know what you've done that's been good. Um, we are very good when we criticise the work of others in pointing out the mistakes that they make. We are not often good at articulating what people did well. Uh, and so sometimes starting a law degree is a real change in the way that we have to think about ourselves and the way that we work. Um, I will get some of you will forget and you will send me an email basically telling me that I have got your mark wrong and that you have never got anything lower than a distinction in your life before. So clearly I am wrong. <coughs> um, and I might be. That sometimes happens. I, you know, miss something. Uh, but on the whole, to get a distinction, you need to have a strong grasp of course matter, comparative to other people. 
You need to appreciate the key issues, perhaps a little bit on finer points, but effectively the requirement to get up to 80% is really high. And to get 80 or over requires exceptionally clear understanding. Oh God, that's very big, isn't it? Uh, it needs to have so much more in it. It needs to distinguish itself from the crowd. Uh, so again, one of the things that you need to do is, is really be careful about this. Think about what it is that you need to deliver in order to meet the criteria. The other thing, and I know everybody gets really bored with this, so I, I will only harp on it today, but I know people hear over and over again, we're looking for master's level. This is a master's level degree. Um, the JD is different from an LLB because it's master's level. But often we don't articulate what that means. And basically, it's the difference between synthesis and analysis. When you did your undergraduate degree, you learnt about things, you pulled them apart and you understood in detail each of the components. Now that we're at a master's level, you are required to synthesise. You are going to be combining those elements and coming up with something new. Your own opinion is now important. But your own opinion based on just what you think is not likely to be enough. Your opinion needs to be grounded in the cases. You only add to your credibility when you can point to others who have a similar opinion to you. Even better, when you can point to people who have different opinions to you, to give them credit and then to explain why you believe that they are incorrect. Um, that you need to be logical you need to apply the cases and you need to get your own understanding of what the law is. I've only put these two case, uh, textbooks up here. Um, I get a lot of questions about textbooks. These are the ones that the readings are based on. Uh, so I, I think they're excellent textbooks actually. Um, I find, I, I, I know, I bag the reading for the first two weeks, possibly because I think the first two weeks, or the first week, this reading you've already done, probably the least interesting from my point of view, because I'm not an academic, I'm a pracademic. Uh, but on the whole, this, the book, particularly the textbook, is really easy to read, uh, and it has a good job of explaining how the cases fit together. It is available online via the library. You can use it on screen pretty much as much as you like. The downside with that is you cannot take an electronic textbook into an exam with you and the licensing limits what you can print. Although, shall I point out, if a few of you got together and agreed to print different bits of it, you could probably get what you needed. But that would be for you to work out amongst yourselves. Having said that, Actually, reading textbooks in an exam, particularly if it's the first time you read them, not such a good idea. Um, in an exam, you're going to need your notes. You're going to need to have things that you're familiar with that you can find very quickly. The biggest thing I hear about exams all the time is I ran out of time. I ran out of time. It's not a place to start reading. Um, but these books are there. They're also, they, they are eye-wateringly expensive. Law books are. Um, and it is actually perfectly possible to proceed without them. It just requires organisation. If you know what the topic is, then there are the books in the library. You can go and see what cases are in there and what the books are. There are also a number of others, both online and physical texts, that are excellent. Stephen Graw's text is particularly good. Um, there's a new one that's just come out that Cambridge have printed and I've just Sorry, the author has gone out of my uh, mind, but I will try and remember to send a reference to it. I'm pretty sure it's in the library, which I'm finding is organised in a slightly different way from most of the others, but often that helps. If you're not understanding something, well, maybe it's because the person and the book are not explaining it well enough for the way your brain works. So find a different explanation. That's a really good tactic for learning something. 
Uh, the case book in particular is really just the relevant extracts of the cases. Some of the cases can be really, really long. Uh, it's not as bad in contract as it is if you do competition and consumer law, where some of the contracts, uh, some of the cases will go for three or four hundred pages. Uh, but here, um, and often our cases are old too, so the language is unfamiliar, so they require a slow read. And many people are more comfortable doing a slow read, a detailed read on paper. Uh, there's also some encyclopedias. So I suspect for those of you who did intro over the weekend, the library would have talked about Hallsbury's Law of Australia or the Laws of Australia, the CCH version, I think it is. Again, they can be quite good places to go for a little pithy explanation of a topic. So um, yet they are eye-wateringly expensive. I think they're a reasonably good investment for this subject in particular because you get to use them again in advanced contract law. Um, but if you can't afford them or just don't want to give Jenny Patterson the money, um, that's, there are definite alternatives for that. Uh, the other thing that you should probably look at at some stage is the Part B. The Part B is in fact terribly named, but it is our contract with you. So um, that piece of uh, the description of the course that basically says what's in it. That's the thing that the uh, Legal Practice Board needs to know that we cover all of the things that need to be covered so that ultimately you can get admitted. So my job is to make sure that we cover off on all of those things. It also sets out all of the dates for assignments and things like that. Um, and basically it also sets out the story arc, for want of a better word, for this course. We're going to start from next week, really, uh, talking about how contracts are made. We're going to start by what agree with what agreement is and we'll move into the idea of consideration uh, and then intention and certainty. Then, once we've understood what the formation elements are, we'll start to look at what we call vitiating factors. And I'll come to that in a minute. We'll talk about the formalities, we'll talk about capacity, and we'll talk about this idea of privity. And then we'll finish, once we've actually worked out how we make a contract, how we work out whether that contract is enforceable, we will then start looking at what the terms of the contract are. So there is a kind of logic to it. So, some helpful stuff. Um, you're going to have to do the reading. I am sorry, there is no alternate for it. If I could get funding, I would try and work out a way to tweet the entire course, but um, I don't think that's going to happen. So, if you can, before class, work out how you work best. There will be weeks for everybody where you don't have time to do all of the reading. Stuff happens. Um, for me, I find in a choice between reading a text and a case, the text is helpful to me because it gives me context and I understand how it fits in. For others, you will feel more comfortable reading the cases and seeing what patterns emerge yourself. Um, play around with the order that suits you. Um, but try and do the reading beforehand. Um, most weeks um, from now on, there will be a desk lecture. So that will be me talking to you about the content. Hopefully we don't repeat much of that in the classroom. How much we repeat really comes down to how well you guys do in a, a quiz that I will start off most classes with and what kind of questions we have and, and where the class takes us. Um, I'm going to present on the basis that you've done the reading. I'm not going to vilify you if you haven't. Um, if you feel inclined, I, we haven't worked out how this class is going to go yet and what your personalities are. If it turns out you're all very quiet, my observation is the more people in the room, the less likely it is that people are calling out answers early on. Um, I might be calling on people. Um, I just need, just do this. This is me, you know, like, like you're at, I don't know how many of you are park runners, you don't want your photo taken at park run. You do this and I won't call on you, okay? Because I don't, my, my task is not to humiliate people. If you haven't done the reading, there's a reason for that and it's not my business and I trust you. Um, so I don't want to embarrass anybody, but if you can do the reading and we can have a meaningful conversation, we have a better time. 
Um, after class is a really good time to go back and consolidate, to think about. So if you're going into a class, particularly if you've got some reflective questions in your head, what's interesting here? What don't I understand? Why, even thinking, why is this reading assigned? Why are these cases relevant? If you can come back after class and answer some of those questions yourself, but also consolidate what questions you have, start thinking about the materials, because we're looking for synthesis here. And no, no reward for just being able to regurgitate materials. Another great thing to do is try and explain what you've learnt to somebody else. Um, that will become really useful really quickly. Uh, just if you remember the slide I showed you a little while ago with Dewey's learning, the act of actually explaining it to somebody else will really help you articulate things clearly. You might be shy about doing that. Siri, the Alexa, whatever your equivalent is, tell that device. Then get it to put it to text for you. Sometimes we're using different parts of our brain when we talk from when we write. Um, so writing it down is one way of consolidating it. Saying it out loud is another way. Reading what you've said out loud is a third way. It's all useful. Um, and it all helps you build those notes that you will need for your exams. Um, try and spend a little time thinking about why, reflecting on what you've learnt. Think about whether or not what you've learnt changes your views. Particularly contract, and we'll talk about this in a minute after we have a little break, but there are all sorts of opportunities in your everyday life to think about contract. Um, get involved, particularly those of you who are online. Talk to each other on Canvas. Create a, sub a study group. Speak with each other. Practice going through that logic. Um, and then be alert, but not alarmed. See what you recognise in the wild. Uh, oh, EndNote. Um, another good thing early on is for those of you who are kind of keen on tech or prepared to experiment with it, um, one of the things that is a big part of successfully navigating a law degree is getting your referencing right. And it's kind of an annoying thing at one level because it's actually just a process job. Um, and again, the robots can do it. Everybody who is a student at RMIT has uh, the right to download a piece of software called EndNote. There's another one which many of you might have used. I think it's called Zotero. I know EndNote. Zotero, I've got no particular uh, reason to say it's good or bad, but I know a lot of, number of people like it. W whatever you're used to is fine. Um, EndNote is an investment, uh, particularly as you have to upload libraries for AGLC4. It's, it's not easy to use, but if you make the... And if you were in... If I was taking you for uh, the M&A subject and it was your last or in your last year, I would say don't bother. Just muddle along the way that you have been. But if you think it's going to be something that's useful to you and you have the time, now's the time to make that investment in how to do that because it will, you can keep a library of your references, you can keep notes in it about why those cases or references are important and you can stick them into your papers and they will be properly formatted. Uh, and so that is something that is, in my view, would be worth doing. But again, if you're not comfortable with technology, you might want to rethink it. Have a look on the library uh, page in the RMIT website. They do a couple of little videos about how to use it. And I'm reliably informed that they have some really good little classes on how to use it too. And if a few of you got together and went to the library and said, we would like an EndNote class that focuses on AGLC4, because it's just such a tiny little sliver of a way of doing referencing, I am pretty sure that they would help you out there. They are ridiculously helpful. And Pauline King, you might have met her yesterday or the day before. She's our, our librarian and, I mean, you'd positively make her day if you said there were four or five of us coming, we want to learn about EndNote. She would organise that in a heartbeat. But whatever your system is, get one. Get a system. Find a way of keeping your stuff. Um, another thing that I'm a big fan of 
is Evernote. Some of you might have come across that. It's a free piece of software that you can just dump things into and search. I'm a big fan of Control F, find things, don't have to keep things in my memory. Um, I like in Evernote because I've been using it for a while. OneNote, which comes with um, all of the Microsoft products now, is, I'm told, pretty good these days as well. And that could be something that you're already using that you're used to. It doesn't really matter what you use. You can use a bullet journal. You could use interpretive dance. You just need to have a system. So you could use interpretive dance. <laughs> so. I want to actually, oh look, I've done it right to the half hour. That's actually quite unlike me. I'm, one thing I'm very bad at is getting my timing right. Should we take a five minute break? I believe the bathrooms are in that direction. There's also a water fountain there. Stretch your legs. Learn the name of somebody you don't already know. And those of you at home, you do the same. And we'll come back in five minutes.